Sports news, the plot line, it was going to be nothing short of epic. A cancer survivor hounded by detractors does the impossible. He returns to the sport he loves and proves them all wrong. Cue the inspiring theme music and let the credits roll. That's the film that director Alex Gibney thought he was going to make in 2009 about Lance Armstrong's heroic comeback to the world of cycling, of course. The project came to a screeching halt when the doping scandal finally engulfed the sport's biggest star. But after Armstrong finally confessed to his sins, Gibney reopened the project. And what began as a sort of fan film turned into an unflinching look at a spiraling web of lies. Living a lie. I didn't live uh, a lot of lies, but I lived one big one. You know, it's different, I guess. Maybe it's not. I certainly was very confident that I would never be caught. Alex Gibney, writer and director of The Armstrong Lie, joins me now from New York. Alex, congratulations. It's a riveting documentary, partly due to the fact that there's something, well, fascinating and maybe even frightening about how much Armstrong believed the lies he was telling to the world. Do you get any sense that he's sorry for what he did or just sorry that he got caught? Well, I think he's sorry for what he did to an extent, but I think most people feel that he's not sorry enough. I mean, I think he hasn't really grappled with the damage that he did off the bike. I think the fury that, that, uh, that served him very well on the bike turned out to be a very damaging off the bike. And also, he told this kind of grand story. It didn't need to be so big. He told a lie that was so enormous. He didn't just say, look, uh, you know, I've never tested positive. He, he would always say, how dare you say that I, as a cancer survivor, would ever use performance-enhancing drugs? And the enormity of that miraculous story, if it were true, came crashing down on him because so many people were pissed off and disappointed. The film makes a clear case Armstrong would have gotten away with it all if he hadn't returned to the Tour de France in 2009. So why did he come back, uh, especially when that risk was out there? I think that's the big mystery of the story. That's the story, that's the mystery that haunts the story. I asked him that very question. I said, you know, didn't you think that people who had suspicions about doping before would come back after you if you came back in 2009? And he didn't just say yes, he said, of course. I thought, wow, of course. So he knew the risk he was taking. And yet I think it was too tantalizing to him. He had been so confident that he could pull it off in the past. And I think also as an athlete, he just couldn't stand being away from the field of battle. So he went back right into the lion's den. You had incredible access to Armstrong for the film. You, you also agreed to pay him for that access. And Armstrong will still get a cut of the proceeds of the film, despite the turn that the storyline ultimately took. Is there any reaction from him? I haven't heard any reaction um, because he hasn't seen it. Uh, you know, we offered him the opportunity to see it, and um, he sent his representatives instead. I think he should see it. Uh, I, think, I think he should see it. Watching the film, it's clear you had a, a friendly relationship with Armstrong, who seems likable on one level. You admit in the film that there was a time when you were rooting for him. You were a fan. You wanted him to make the impossible comeback. He calls you Alex when he speaks to the camera. Do you personally feel betrayed at all? Yeah, I feel betrayed. Um, I mean, I think I was used. That maybe is, uh, is what really pissed me off the most. I understood that part of my role in the 2009 film, the comeback film, was to be part of the PR machinery. And a guy who had done investigative films before, now watching this great comeback, which would then hopefully, you know, give some coloration to the magic of his... Um, uh, career and, and, and help solve some of those questions that people had raised in the past. So that's the part I think that, uh, that infuriated, the most, me, infuriated me the most, that I felt like I had been part of the PR campaign, the cover-up. And of course there were all those people who had been trying to drop a dime and tell the truth about him and he, he went out and tried to destroy them. How much did people like uh, Cheryl Crow and, and other people who are big parts of, of his life, how much did they protect him knowing what the lie was? I think one of the most fascinating aspects of this story is that this was a lie that hid in plain sight for many, many years. And there are many people who are complicit in this, the sponsors, the, uh, the cycling organizations, celebrities, uh, people close to Armstrong, cyclists who had the code of omerta, the code of silence, and the media, I would add. And, and us, fans, who, you know, it, on the podium in 2005, Armstrong said, as he was leaving, seemingly for the, the last time, I'm sorry for you who can't dream big. 
I'm sorry for you who don't believe in miracles. Well, this is from an atheist, and yet somehow we wanted to believe in the miracle even though we knew better. Uh, and there was a huge mechanism around Armstrong's lie that enabled it to, to happen. I just have to ask you, neither one of us is qualified as a, as a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but his lies just seemed so deep that it seemed almost sociopathic. Uh, and that's why I think so many people are, are so angry at him because they believed in him and his lies were just staggering. I mean, I, I really honestly, thinking about it, can't think of a bigger liar in the sports world. I, don't, I know you can't diagnose him, but, but how deep do you think these lies are? Here's what I think about that. I, I'm uncomfortable with the word sociopath, but I think he was deeply afflic afflicted with what the police call noble cause corruption. That's what they call bad cops who slip marijuana cigarettes into people's pockets because they can't get them any other way. I think Lance felt that his story was so inspiring, so good, that he could be bad. That was okay. It was okay if he went after people and went after them hard. Why? Because he was raising millions of dollars for cancer. You know, uh, a social psychologists tell us that we may be hardwired for moral mediocrity. And I think the grander that Lance's story became, the more vicious he uh, lashed out at his critics and the more able he was to tell the most fantastic lies straight to our faces without any compunction at all. And I think there were times, you know, in order to be a really good liar, you have to believe your lies in some fundamental way, or in some emotional way. And I think that's what allowed Armstrong to get away with it. Well, it's a, it's a brilliant work. Congratulations, Alex. The documentary thank is The Armstrong Lie. It opens in select cities to get today. Alex, give me thank you so much.